Well, hello there, everyone. This is Clint Finney for an Eastern Ohio Grazing Council virtual pasture walk, for May the 28th, 2020. We've got a real treat for you guys this week. Uh, we're at the farm of Jules and Jody Rehovic, just outside Smithfield, Ohio, in Jefferson County. We've got several videos that we shot uh, out there last week. If you remember last week, it was pretty cold then, and now it's pretty warm. And then we've also got a lot of great pictures that Beth has shot that we're going to do some uh, talking and description um, during the length of this pasture walk, just to give you an idea about what they've got going on out there. So let's get started. I wanted to give you a little background information about Jules and Jody's operation. The center part of the farm pictured here um, actually belongs to Jody's parents, her late father and mother. And uh, Jules and Jody's house is on the north end of the farm. And they, they bought a farm on the south end that adjoins the same property line as their parents' farm. So they manage the, the, the pastures all as one with one cow herd. Uh, they do have some hay acreage that they custom hire someone to make the hay, although Jules does help uh, that guy make the hay and he helps him on other farms around the area. But uh, Family is a big part of their operation. They've got two daughters that live in the Columbus area and several grandchildren. And so Jules and Jody do a great job at managing their pastures and managing their forage heights uh, to be able to have a set of pastures to turn the cattle into with fault-free gravity-fed water so that they can go away and, and enjoy their grandkids for the weekend or go away on vacation. Uh, and, and still be able to manage the forages. And, and I know we get that question a lot with grazing systems. If we're gonna move cows all that often, how are we ever gonna get away? And Jules and Jody have done a great job at figuring out how to manage those things. Uh, Jules was a, was a steel worker. He's recently retired and, and Jody was recently retired from the Buckeye Local School District. Uh, lucky for her, she never had me as a student, but they, they both retired in the length of time that we've been working out there with them on the farm. and. And, and getting away and being able to visit with family and go on vacation is an important part of their operation. And they do a great job at managing the forage and managing their grazing system so they can do that. Um, I wanted to take a short video here with uh, Jules and Jody's cows. And if you've ever driven by their farm, you know that it's the farm with the white cows. We were just having a conversation about uh, the white cows and, and what they have there. Charlay cows have uh, used char purebred Charlay bulls for many, many years since the 60s, they tell me. Uh, so right outside of Smithfield, if you drive by, there's a herd of white cows that's always known as that's theirs. Uh, growing up as a young boy going to the Jefferson County Fairgrounds all the time, this was the farm I knew as, as the farm with white cows. And, and now with my son, when, when we go to the fairgrounds, he says, there's the farm with the white cows. And that means we're close to the fairgrounds. So we wanted to get a picture of them. We talked uh, with Jules about cow size and, and he says because of the grazing council, he's, he's made an, a concentrated effort to reduce the size of the cow herd. And that's something that we hear about with Charlays is they're, they're bigger cows. And, and he has done a really good job at, at getting them to, to, to a smaller size. We know you all enjoy pictures of the cows and, and how things are going. They're calving right now, they're just finishing up. Um, so. You see some baby calves in here, and, and the, one of the other videos we shot, we got some of the twins. Jules has had outstanding luck with having twins here in the last several years. He's had more set of twins than anybody else I know. So this is a field, Jules said that they'd been in here about a week. Um, he's trying to graze this one down because he'll move the bull in here after the cows leave. Uh, so he wants it to be a shorter height so it doesn't get ahead of that bull. Um, one thing while we're here, I think we'll shoot to the kind of the grass height and what we're seeing. Uh, realizing this is a week before we're going to post this video to to everybody, but and we may be seeing something different next week. But uh, we do notice that the cows are, are not grazing some things. They're leaving it kind of rough. And what I notice is a lot of times it's the fescue, it's the annual bluegrass, it's the stuff that's gone to seed that they're not wanting to graze, but they're wanting to graze the more tender stuff, the stuff that's higher energy, the clovers, the orchard grass, the, the blue grasses. Um, that, that's a common thing that we're going to see this spring. Uh, and as spring progresses, everything will get to this stage, and then the cows will have to eat that stuff that's, that's out there. That's just something that we always see.
as I watched over the videos, I, I realized that we had some wind there in that last one and I uh, wanted to clean up some things just a minute. But we talked about the forage height and how it sort of looks kind of rough out there, especially this time of year as we're coming into the spring flush and things are going to seed. And uh, we're, we're ha we have trouble getting cows to, to graze the forage evenly. I, I have the same trouble with my sheep or the goats at home. Um, and, and that's just a part and parcel of spring and grazing management. So we've got a couple options here. Um, we can kind of keep grazing through and, and being that we shot that video a week ago, I know that Jules has now clipped this pasture uh, to get it back in shape. And, and that's a perfectly fine management strategy uh, for what we're seeing here. The cows are going to go after the orchard grass and the Kentucky bluegrass and the clovers and the alfalfas. And they're going to tend to leave the annual bluegrass and the fescue behind uh, and let them go to seed. And that's part of, for those of us that are concerned about fescue moving into our pastures, that's part of how fescue gains a foothold is because this time of year, the cows don't really like it and don't graze it as much. And so it sits there and it goes to seed and then that seed is left in the seed bank and anytime it gets a chance to grow, it's gonna grow. And so that's how, how pastures turn from uh, orchard grass and Kentucky bluegrass to fescue. Uh, so we've got several options there. We can we can go out and clip those fields after the cows have moved on. Or I did a presentation last week about high stocking density grazing. And this time of year is when I start to, to put those cows into smaller pastures and move them more often to get them to either eat or trample that forage. And regrows and doesn't go ahead and go to seed. So just something for us to think about as we're managing the forage. We're going to talk about the spring flush uh, here in the coming weeks and how to manage it, but just a good photo of that. While we were here uh, and in watching the videos, we saw a bunch of barn swallows swooping in and out of, of the video. And I thought it was important to mention uh, with this picture, especially Beth said, I tried so hard to get a picture of the barn swallow and as I found this picture, I said, well, there's one right there between the cows swooping through. Uh, we're seeing a bunch of birds this year. Um, Beth and I have, have spent time identifying a few. I mean, of course, we got the barn swallows, but we found some other birds out there in our pastures that we, we don't normally see. And that is that is a good thing. And that's why I want to bring it up. Um, we, we've got those birds because we've got the insects for them to be there. Uh, and you may not think of insects as a good thing in our cow herd, but if we keep those barn swallows and tree swallows and all those other things happy, they're eating tons of flies that, that our cattle produce. They're also eating other bugs and insects that come up from our pasture. It's the same thought as uh, if we look out across the pasture and we see lots of spider webs. Um, th those are, are indicators that we've got lots of predators out there and that tells us that our, our forage quality is good and our soil health is good. So those are good indicators to, to show that we're, we're doing a good job that our pasture ecosystem is in good shape. We may have got ahead of ourselves here a little bit with the, the pasture walk and some of the videos uh, without stating the way that the property was when they purchased it. The, what is the southernmost part of their farm uh, that they own um, when they bought it um, almost 15 years ago it was completely covered in junk and i searched for a, a better way to to say that but uh, refuse or whatever however you want to to, to put it uh, but jody told me they they got rid of almost 2,000 tires uh, one of the photos here on this slide is a pile of gas tanks from cars that were scrapped and the scrap folks wouldn't take the gas tanks. Uh, there was piles and piles and piles of other things along the way that they've cleaned up on this Southern property uh, and, and got it back into grazing shape. And I think you've already seen from the videos we've shown, but also the pictures previous and after this, uh, what the property looks like today. It's an amazing transformation. I included a picture there um, with Jules and the brush hog because he bought he told me he bought that tractor and brush hog specifically just to clean up this farm and uh, they told me several times about brush hogging uh, this particular farm with that tractor and brush hog and steering with brakes because the brush was so thick it was lifting the front end of the tractor up and I can attest to that I was at that farm 
uh, shortly after they bought it. And, and I, I can't believe the transformation uh, that they've been able to make in such a short period of time. And I, I know it doesn't seem short to them. It was a whole lot of work and they're to be commended for the work that they've put into cleaning up this farm. Just some sort of before and after pictures here uh, of what it looked like back then and what it looks like now. The top half being uh, what, what it used to look like and the bottom half what it looks like now. The top left there being the southernmost farm. Of course, that was in the snow, uh, but just the, the thickness of the brush. And there was a pond down in that ravine there somewhere and uh, all kinds of, of junk. And there was even a boat in that pond, even though the pond wasn't hardly big enough for the boat that was in it. Um, and, and then now they've cleaned it up, got the pond looking nice. They totally redid, refab the pond, put a whole new dam in and everything. Um, and then the right hand side, that's actually a picture from State Route 151 down um, in the tree line that you see. That's the property line. And, and then the picture in the bottom is actually the fence line. Now that fence line is where that tree line was. That's how, how thick the tree line fence line was and then you can even tell there were fields on the other side of of that tree line but now it, that's how much work they've done in cleaning up this particular farm again just some still shots um top half being what the farm looked like and bottom half being what it looks like now and some of it you can kind of see um the top left there uh that's the the brush and things top or bottom left um now cleaned up and, and the pictures from further away but still uh, you can really see the difference that they've made in the farm. Um, right hand side, piles of brush, piles of junk, piles of trash, tires in the way, a ravine cut down through the middle. And, and now uh, how cleaned up it is, you can see a water trough in that picture. And we'll talk about the water system here as we go along and a fence split up between it. And, and Jules and Jody would be the first ones to say that they're not done. They've got a lot left to do. But my goodness, from what it was before uh, to what it is now, I, I, I'll be the first to tell them they, they could stop now if they so choose because the world of difference they've made in this farm, it, it's just amazing, astonishing to me what they've been able to do. Last set here of before and after photos. And we took the top photos uh, when we were there. Uh, the and uh, I, I couldn't even really tell you where they are. Usually when we take pictures, I'm pretty good at looking back and saying, oh, that's this field or that field. And those ones there, I can't tell, but it doesn't really matter. That's, that's what the farm looked like. Uh, that's after Jules had already been brush hogging on it for a couple of years and, and been beating on the edges. And, and the bottom photos, I just wanted to include just to, to show the difference in the quality of forage. And we're gonna be talking about this as, as we go on. The bottom right hand picture there, um, Beth took that and uh, as I was looking at it, I said, what a great photo of what our forage mix should be out there in the pasture field. Uh, I can see fescue and orchard grass and bluegrass. I can see plantain. I can see red clover, probably see some white clover in there. There'll be some additional forbs, but uh, that's like a picture perfect photo of what our forage species and composition should be out there in the field. And, and that's the way Jules has got, Jules and Jody both have got these, this farm looking now. I mean, it's actually producing good quality pasture. One of the things that I, I wanted to talk about when we talked about coming out here to Verhovics was um, we see a lot of focus on bale grazing and bale feeding especially with the regenerative folks these days and and for the most part those are in drier more brittle climates warmer climates but one of the ways that Jules and Jody have really improved this farm is by bale feeding in the areas that they've kind of cleaned up so they for at the early on stages Jules was kind of picking a field and, and just feeding hay in that field and then letting it recover and now we're at the point where he's got a lot of the fields recovered and so he's just picking spots, uh, places that are thin and feeding hay in those areas uh, and letting them kind of recover from that. So he said to me today that he just picks a spot, feeds one bale and moves the ring on to another place. And he's done an excellent job at doing that. That's a hard thing to do to keep the cows from overgrazing fields, but they've done a great job at, at picking a selective area, using that sort of as their sacrifice bale feeding area and then moving on to another area the next year and, and really improving the fertility and bringing new species back to the, to the farm. 
recovering it from what it was and, and brush and all those things. So I think just a really good thing to point out here at this farm is bale feeding has been part of their recovery for this farm and, and, and getting it to recover from what it was when they bought it to what it is today. After looking at the bale grazing sort of fields there, uh, I come back to this picture and I know I've had this in here before, but what a great picture of the quality forage that's out there. And, and, and this is just a good picture in general of what a quality pasture should look like. I can see perennial ryegrass, I can see Kentucky fescue, I can see Kentucky bluegrass, I can see plantain, some white clover, some red clover. If we looked hard enough, we'd see some alfalfa, there's some annual bluegrass, but just a great diverse mix of forage. And what that tells me is that there's pretty good soil health uh, below the surface. Um, we, we know that they've reclaimed this farm from brush, and so the soil health was already there. And they've done a great job at putting out uh, a good mix of forage and, and managing it so a good mix of forage would, would regrow on those areas. Jules brought us up here in this field because he wanted to show wanted to show us all the mallflower rows that was in this field and, and I think he wanted to figure out why, but he'd come up here with a spot sprayer and, and hit it all with a spot sprayer and we had a hard time finding a live multiflora rose plant in this field. So what he did was he used crossbow and spot sprayed the mallflower rose plants individually uh, and got a pretty good kill on the mallflower rose. But while we were up here, Jules and I were talking and he's like, I, he said, I'm glad you told me that about crossbow that, that I didn't want to spray the whole field because it would kill the clover. And he said he would have went ahead and sprayed the whole field uh, if, I, if we hadn't said that at a grazing meeting somewhere along the way. And, um, that's sort of showing you all the clover that we've got in this field. Uh, if we'd have sprayed the whole field with crossbow, we'd of course killed all the broadleafs, had nothing left but grass. But by doing these little spots, all you see dead is the mallflower rose. You don't see any of the clover that was killed because of the spraying. So very good job of spot spraying and controlling mallflower rose. Something that we see, especially in the southern part I notice of Jefferson County, we get lots of this little multiflower rose. And we got to remember, we reclaimed, or they reclaimed this farm from multiflower rose. They've told us several times here today about brush hog, and this is the first time, and the multiflower rose was so thick, it was picking the front of the tractor up as they were going over the multiflower rose. And I remember it looking like that. And these are just remnants. They're going to keep spotting up of a multiflower rose in these fields. So good job of, of multiflower rose control. While we're sort of on this mallflower rose control topic, I, I want to kind of clear up some of the things that we talked about in the video. I mentioned that it's a problem in southern Jefferson County. That I want to say that it's a problem everywhere. Uh, all over the eastern Ohio Grazing Council uh, coverage area, mallflower rose is a problem. But being that I'm from southern Jefferson County, and I know that our farm was used as a test plot for living fence, mallflower rose, and knowing that Mount Pleasant and Smithfield kind of mirror each other in their landform and, and the area that they take up and even the history of the area, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to know that there were some living fence test plots done in the Smithfield area as well. So we've got a large seed bank of Marflower Rose. It's been here for a long, long time. Plus, when we get to the further western parts and northern parts of the Grazing Council area, uh, we get into more cropped areas, more cropland areas. And so the monoflower rose has been controlled in those areas and hasn't been grown out across the landscape. Am I saying that it's only a problem in southern Jefferson County? No, uh, it's a problem everywhere that we go. But we do see an awful lot of, of small monoflower rose growing up in all of our pastures all the time because our seed bank is so large. And then as we talk about monoflower rose control, I think we need to talk about the three options we have in control. So the first one we've kind of already covered here is herbicide. Uh, we can use something like crossbow that's a broadleaf killer, knowing that it's going to kill alfalfa, red clover, white clover, uh, bird's foot tree foil, any of the broadleaf forbs that we have out there that we want. Uh, but it will also kill mallflower rose, any broadleaf problem weed. So we need to be careful about where we apply it. And we may have to go back and reseed some of those, those broadleaf um, legumes or forbs back into our pasture if we've used too much. We can use a product like Roundup, of course. 
Uh, Roundup's a uh, brush killer. It's going to kill everything pretty much as it touches. So uh, we have to be careful with that. But if it fits in your management strategy, by all means, it's, it's a product that we can use. There are many other brush killers out there that we can use in the herbicide world. Uh, I don't have time to go through them all today, but they're out there. There are other options. And then we can talk about mechanical control. You know, we can go out and mow these fields and continually mow them, and we'll eventually get some type of control on the monoflower rows. Uh, hopefully good grazing management, uh, good grazing pressure will eventually allow the forage to grow in such a way that it will, will crowd it out. In this field, I'll, I'll say that Jules has done a great job at managing it chemically, but also mechanically because he's he's taken the mower to that field and clipped it and kind of kept it knocked back. I think because they spent so much time reclaiming this farm from autoflower rows, they want to use every tool that they can to help keep it from taking it back over, and that's perfectly fine. And then the last option is biological control. Uh, I was kind of teasing Jules uh, when we were out there that when I went out there all those years ago, he was interested in having some goats at that farm. And uh, here we are all these years later and there's still no goats and they've got um, <clears throat> woven wire fence all the way around the farm now. So it would hold goats. And, and I said, you know, Jules, you just need to get some goats. And he said, I'm still thinking about it. And, and, and by all means, that, that is a control of, of broadleaf weeds and wildflower rows. We can use goats in that way. Now, there are things we have to think about with goats, too. Goats are, are healthiest when they're not grazers, when they're browsers. Uh, that keeps them out of parasite trouble. So as long as we've got monoflower rows and broadleaf weeds, the goats are happy. If we turn them into grazers, then we've got issues with them. And, and a goat will eventually eat themselves out of house and home. And we kind of kind of eat themselves out of the goat business pretty quick. So we, we need to be careful with them. But by all means, if we have the fencing and the ability, and, and we like goats, we can use goats and even my hair sheep are, are pretty good at controlling broadleaf weeds and monoflower rows out there in the field. As we were riding around looking at the farm that day, uh, as we went through this field, um, Jules and I were riding in the side by side together. And uh, he said, I bet you don't remember this field, do you? And I said, no, I, I remember that we were here and looked at some things and you, you bale grazed on this field. and and that you'd reclaimed it from brush, but I don't remember exactly what you're talking about. And he said, well, it was covered in ragweed. He said, I had finished bale feeding on it and uh, seeded it down and it grew up in ragweed. And he said, I called you out here and had you look at it to tell me what to do with it. And he, he said, you told me just to, just to stay the course, continue to mow it. You'll eventually take care of that ragweed and you've got the seed in the seed bank. This, the seed bank will take care of it. It'll come back into forage if we just continue to mow it and he says now look at it it looks good and i, I it, it did it, it was it, it's good forage and grown into clover and alfalfa and, and all the grasses that we've talked about all along and i guess i'm not putting this in here to toot my own horn that, that i was giving him the right advice because i think that i can be wrong just like everybody else but what i'm saying is as we're talking about weed control and monflower rose control um, sometimes just stay in the course and continuing to manage it correctly and, and going in there and mowing the field can, can do a world of good for us. We can turn a field around just by managing it correctly. And, and I think that field was a, a good example of, boy, when it grew up in, in ragweed, and I know what Jules was thinking was, oh my goodness, this is always going to be ragweed and it's going to spread ragweed all over the farm. But just with some continued management and mowing, uh, kind of turn that field back to a really good pasture. All right, um, we wanted to show you the spring development here at Jules and Jody's place. And uh, we did kind of a unique thing with this spring development um, because this farm was isolated at the time and, and really didn't have any electric or place to pump water. We, we developed a spring up here in this little valley and brought it down to this first trough and then once this one was in, we surveyed across the hollow here and found that we could run a trough all the way over there. So where you see the cows, there's a trough just above them. So that's, um, I, I think it's just a couple feet of difference in elevation between this trough and that far one there. And then once we got it to that one, we had to bring the overflow water back down to the stream. So at that point, we're above the pond. We run it to another trough 
down low that you can kind of see through the trees and then run it down into the valley and so that water then feeds back in and, and is part of the reservoir or part of the pond water. So we were able to water several different paddocks here with one spring development where a lot of times we're working with pressurized water and, and we can kind of put water where we want to with this one with spring water because the spring was so high we were able to get water everywhere that we, we needed to, to put it for these, this set of paddocks down here on this end of the farm. As we talked about water systems, I thought it was important to mention that uh, it was good at that farm that we had a spring development that was up high and we could run pastures, uh, run water systems to most of their pastures uh, just from that one spring. Uh, I wanted to point it out because when they bought that farm, they had no access to electricity. So we had to use gravity fed water to be able to make it work out. Uh, and as we look at other farms and we talk to other farmers, you know, this is kind of the preferred system. If, if we all had a spring up high that we could run water to every pasture, we would do it. But not all, every farm is like that. So we, we go to pressurized options so often because it, it's the, the cheaper of, of the options. Spring developments aren't cheap. And if we have to develop more than one or two spring developments for an operation, we're better off to put a pressurized system in and be able to put water where we need it to be. So I just thought it was good to, to point out that uh, springs are a great system. Uh, I would prefer that every farm have at least one spring in case of power failure or whatever, one good water system that's gravity fed and they can go to if they lose power. But outside of that, you know, if we've got the option for pressurized water, it's a great option. We can put water wherever we want it. Springs are tricky, as we're going to talk about here in, in future slides. Um, sometimes we, we develop springs that don't work out and or don't produce enough water or uh, don't put water where we need it to be. So uh, when we're thinking about water systems, just keep your options open for what will work. Thank goodness that this spring is a good spring, works out great for Jules and Jody, gives them fault-free water in the pastures, helps them manage their goals. But this system doesn't work everywhere. Some places we have to have a pressurized system. And, and if we're going to develop more than, as I said, two or three springs, then we're better off to put a pressurized system in. While we're here too, uh, a very good picture of a tire water trough. This is a, a used heavy equipment tire with the top cut out of it. Uh, the pipe that you see sticking up is the overflow pipe. That has an elbow down in the water so that the, the leaves and things that fall in the water don't go out the overflow. They stay in there unless you pull the overflow off so it won't plug it up. You can see the hole drilled in the pipe there. That's one thing that I think when we put this one together, I think it was this trough, um, we were having trouble getting the water out. And then we realized that we hadn't drilled the hole in there. So that hole has to be there to let the air out so that the water will go out the overflow. But if you're interested in a heavy equipment tire tank, this is a good example of one. Uh, one of the things that we helped them with years ago was uh, putting in a heavy use pad under their lot. They use this for weaning. Right now it's got a bull and a steer on it. Um, if they got a cow that they need to catch. So we put this heavy use pad in here and then also a frost free water so that they can keep cows in here um, whenever they go away they've got a, a water that's automatic and it'll work for them um, right here close to the barn but they use this lot for lots of things throughout the year um, depending on what they're doing whether it's weaning calves treating cows or or now with the bull and the steer on it while we were down here at this lot Jules and I were kind of discussing the brand new shiny sheep that was sitting there and uh, just thought it was important maybe to talk about that just for a little bit. If you know me, you know that I, I don't like to talk about shoots and working facilities. I prefer to spend my time thinking about the grass and the water and the fence and the management uh, rather than I do the, the working facility. But a good thing to point out right now, Jules and I were uh, long members of the No Shoot Club. I think they had an old shoot at one time, but uh, I, I've lived without one for almost 30 years at this point, and, and I'm kind of glad that he, he left the club because I'm thinking I'm going to do the same thing this summer because I've got some things, some reasons that, that it would be nice to have a shoot at this point, some things that I want to do. And, and, and the reason why I put this in here is just because I think we spend an awful lot of time looking at fancy shoots, and fancy working facilities, and, and, and so often I go out to new farms that 
before the cows have even struck the ground, uh, they've got a fancy working facility and, and thousands of dollars wrapped up into managing the cows when, when we really should have thought about our economics and put our money into the grazing system and managing things uh, and, and maybe could have lived with a, a lighter kind of working facility, a less fancy working facility, let's put it that way. I, I just prefer to think about the grazing management. And, and I'll tell you that living without a chute for 30 years has got me to a place where I don't need it for a lot of things. I, I, I now have reasons that I, I want to have one, but I ha also know that I won't use it as much as, as you might think because I've, I've learned to live without one. I've learned to send the problem cows to town. I've learned that, that we can manage things in such a way to head off the problems before they start. Now, have I headed cows to town that could have been worked on in a chute? Sure. Have I had to load up one every once in a while and take them somewhere to, to be worked on in a chute? Yeah, I have. And do I think that we that every operation, every every beef cow operation specifically, should have a working chute? Yeah, I, I think they do. But uh, we need to keep our economies in line and, and think about what's gonna, gonna make us money in an operation. And, and the chute will make you money, don't, don't get me wrong, but the management, the cow herd, and the thinking about not using the chute has, has helped me in the long run. And I just thought that was a, a good thought to point out. All right, so when we were talking about coming out here to Jules and Jody's to do a pasture walk, I said the, the one thing I wanted to, to do as well as look at the cows and the grass and the spring over there that works is to, to look at maybe our one failure here. Um, this is a, a spring. It was a wet area, a ponded area when I first came here all those years ago. And we were just sure we could develop a spring in this area and, and get water out. And we had uh, an excavator in here and, and dug a huge trench. It was seven or eight feet deep. and and looking for water and, and couldn't find it. And we eventually just gave up uh, because we couldn't couldn't get any water to, to flow. Uh, and since then, they've done some work around here and we've now found the stream. We think we can come back in and redevelop it. But I think it's just good to point out that springs aren't always easy. They're not always perfect and they, they never are the same. And so this one, we just had to give up on and walk away from because it wasn't gonna do what we needed to do at the time. So keep that in mind as we talk about water systems and springs when we talk about pressurized water we can put that anywhere when we talk about a spring that's already developed and really good and we can run water like the one we showed here uh, to wherever we need it we, we've got good water here it was a crapshoot we, we didn't know for sure and, and we ended up having to do a whole different thing because this spring didn't work out we think it'll work out in the future we think now we can develop it and get it to work but at that point, we just couldn't get anything developed and get it to work right. This is the before picture of the failed spring there that we had in the video just before. Um, you can see there, there's ice there. That, that was how much water that was holding back. And that water just sat there all the time. And uh, we were sure we could get that developed. We were sure that that water it was there in the dry parts of the summer. It was there in the wet parts of the winter. And we were just sure, and you can see that there was kind of a thawing over there on that front corner. And that's where we assumed the water was coming from. And, and we dug and dug and dug and didn't find the water. And now that they've got the area drained out, we found where the stream actually is coming in. And uh, we hope we can get it developed here in the future. As we were leaving Jules and, and Jody's, uh, he, he showed me this kind of cool contraption. And I thought maybe some of you would enjoy this, but... Uh, Jules has devised this system uh, to tag and band his newborn calves. So he uses the loader on the tractor and picks that bail ring up and uh, takes it over and just lowers it nice and easy on the calf. And he's got an opening in the wire. He can open and go in. You see one of the bars is missing there on the bail ring. He can sneak in that bail ring, get in there and work on that calf. And then when he's all done, sneak back out, pick the bail ring back up and let the calf go. I've seen uh, those things. And, and one of the pasture walks we had a couple years ago, a guy had one on his side by side to be able to catch calves. Uh, but this is kind of a low cost way to, to go out there and catch a calf. If you're worried about the, the cow and, and her getting to you, um, this is one way to, to help with that. I'll contend we should 
uh, remove those cows from the herd, but that doesn't mean that she didn't have a calf there before we figured that out. So a kind of a good, safe way to help manage uh, those calves and, and get things taken care of. Tools at Jody's place along with her parents' place it is such a picturesque farm that I wanted Beth to take a panoramic view of the entire operation. Now, I, this is from the back and, and we didn't take it from the front because of the highway and all the noise that would be there, but just wanted to show you guys so you get a feeling for, for how picturesque the whole entire operation is um, with with all the, the fences and barns and everything clean and nice and, and looking good and the forage growing here great in the spring. Uh, just a, a heck of an operation to get the opportunity to do a pasture walk at. Well, that's a wrap for the May virtual pasture walk for the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. We'll end as always by thanking our sponsors and also a big thank you to Jules and Jody Verhovic for allowing us the time to come out there and ride around with them and look at their farm and talk about their operation and look at all the changes that they've made over the past 15 years of hard work there at their operation. We truly do thank you for your time. Other than that, uh, thank all of you for tuning in and be looking for uh, another web presentation next Thursday and other information about the Grazing Council as time goes on. We'll see you next time.